Welcome, Linda and Charlie, to the Mental Health Toolbox. Thank you so much for making time today to share your collective wisdom on relationships and all things communication. I'm so delighted to be with you. Thanks for inviting us. Ah, my pleasure. I am. Uh, I'm excited to hear about your new book and all of your wisdom that our listeners and viewers are going to benefit from in terms of nuggets of wisdom and how they can communicate more effectively and argue less with their loved ones, right? Because that's the goal. <laughs> less arguing, better relationships in general, right? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and uh, share with us a little bit about who you are, your background, and what led you into this particular niche of uh, mental health? Well, yeah. we're both psychotherapists mm -hmm. and we're recovered hotheads. Because <laughs> in the early years of our relationship, we used to argue very unskillfully and brought some unskillful patterns from our families mm -hmm. of origin, but we're both good students. So we paid attention and we got some really good help. And we learned so much that it became one of our specialties. Robert Bly says, let your wound become your gift to your community. So we started specializing in treating couples and teaching workshops. And one of the workshops we teach is called From Conflict to Connection. Oh, I love that. What a great title. So many good notes for our workshop. And we blogged a lot about conflict management and repair and forgiveness and apologies and so forth that we said we should really put this all together in a book to really help people have more harmony in their life and save them some trouble. I love it. Mm -hmm. What a way to give back and also leverage your expertise and what's worked for you. I think that's always a secret sauce is when something has worked for you and then you're able to turn around and share that with other people. It's especially effective because you know the ins and outs of it because you were in the trenches of it yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. We like to uh, think that we walk the talk. And I think that's really critical if you're doing this work of, uh, particularly with couples therapy, um, advice is so easy to give. And um, it's not necessarily um, going to be helpful if you don't really know the territory. And I think one of our claims to fame is that we have not had an, a perfectly smooth relationship, that we've had some serious ups and downs and uh, like Linda said, we've been able to learn from them. We've learned so much from the clients that we've worked with and students. And, um, you know, so being a lifelong learner really is, I think, one of the keys to it, you know, because you're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, mistakes aren't the problem. The question is whether or not you take anything away from those mistakes, whether there's something of value that you have learned that you can apply in the future so you don't continue to repeat the same kinds of mistakes. So oh, golden nugget right there is that it's not about having a perfect relationship, right? It's about mm -hmm. learning from your mistakes, right? Whether it's a communication or otherwise, and yeah. then right. trying to not repeat those mistakes. Yeah, put, put quotes around mistakes because <laughs> yeah. they're really not, they, they really are truly, I know this is a cliche, but they really are learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And our students, clients, and readers love it when we tell our gory stories about when we didn't do it right, and then how we learned to do it better. And they seem to be inspired because they see that we're so happy. You know, we we just had a fiftieth wedding anniversary. Wow! Congratulations. Thank you. And you know, it's not just staying together for fifty years, but really, we're thriving and we're in a golden age and really enjoying our lives and enjoying our family and our friends. And so they see that we're really happy now. So when we t tell the dark, shadowy stories, mm -hmm. it seems to inspire them that they can do at least that well. They were so screwed up, and look how happy they are. Let's pay attention yeah. to what they're saying. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I, for one, really appreciate your transparency. You know, it takes takes big people to admit, you know, and share your personal struggles, mm -hmm. right? Especially relationship stuff. That's, that's a special kind of self-disclosure that I think is really appreciated, especially when you're helping this population. I'm sure it makes a big difference. Mm, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm excited to dive into this with you. Um, 
So your book has been out for a couple months now, right? Yep. Came out Valentine's Day. Yes. An end to arguing, right? Right. Okay. Excellent. Do you want do you have that with you so we can all see it? I have it here. And we're proud all of right. it. And we, An we published to... four books before this one. Mm -hmm. And the people who have read all of our books, a lot of them say, this is your best book. And we are wow. inclined to agree with them. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Do you have an audio book version of it? Or is, or is this just... Not the, yet. Not yet. Okay. No. In the works? Uh, coming soon. No, that'd be great. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. I'm an audio guy myself. I love reading, but... I really love audiobooks because mm -hmm. I can maybe it's multitasking. I don't know. I find it very grounding because I can be in the garden or doing other things while I have it in my yeah. ears. And it's a different kind of learning. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So you've been working on this book. You've put it together. Now it's out, right? Um, for those interested in learning more about communication and improving their relationships, what would you say or the what would you say their foundation or quick tips that they should really be focused on or uh, leveraged from from your work? Well, the thing that comes to mind is you're asking if you're asking that Patrick is um, that so many people underestimate the challenge of creating a, a truly meaningful relationship. Hmm. Um, it's, um, I, I think, one of the biggest and most important challenges that we face in life. And, and the, the reason that it is so challenging is, is because we are re <clears throat> required to do two seemingly contradictory things simultaneously. One, is to give our committed, caring, purposeful attention to the relationship and to the needs of the relationship and to the other person without losing ourselves in the process. Mm. So we have to take care of ourselves and we have to take care of the relationship and, and the other person. And, and I think that when we misjudge or underestimate the magnitude of that challenge, that we're faced with literally in an ongoing basis. You know, th there isn't a day that goes by that, you know, we don't have to make a decision. Should I defer to, you know, my partner or do I need to take a stand on this? Hmm. You know, everything from small things, you know, like whose turn it is to do the dishes to big things, you know, like uh, we're going to have children or not. <laughs> mm, yeah, doesn't you get much bigger so, than that. Yeah. Every day we're faced with, with that challenge. And I think that when we fail to recognize the magnitude of that challenge, it's really easy to get into blame. You know, that, you know, there's something wrong with, you know, you need to see it my way, or I need to get behind your view, you know, this, this view that it's one way or the other. It's, it's one of us is going to win, one of us is going to lose. Um, and um, that's set up for argument, you know, mm -hmm. because then we have to defend our position. And when we're defending it, it's really hard for us to hear openly without judgment what the other person feels and needs. So, so you know, I, I think the first, the first thing that I would say in response to your question is just recognize that what you've taken on here is, is a very worthwhile, perhaps the... the most worthwhile um, factor in your whole life hmm. uh, in terms of how you relate to other people, particularly your, your life partner, if you have one. Um, and to cut yourself some slack, to cut them some slack, to know that um, this, is, this is potentially incredibly rewarding, amazingly rewarding. But it's not going to be without the bumps on the road. And when you can accept that, it just makes it easier not to get into blame, but just to recognize, okay, you know, nobody ever told me that it was going to be easy. In <laughs> fact, they told me it was going to be challenging, <clears throat> but they also told me, and this is what we tell people, it's worth the effort. Mm. 
-hmm. It's worth, you're going to have to go through some stuff that isn't going to be comfortable, but it's worth it because when you get to the other side of it, and it doesn't necessarily have to take as long as it did for us, <laughs> you can get to the <laughs> other side of it a lot quicker than we did mm -hmm. <clears throat> because we were young and pretty naive and pretty arrogant in some ways too. Um, you can get there if you have the intention and develop the skills and promote, cultivate the values and the traits that will enable you to be effective in your communication. Mm -hmm. Oh, very well said. As you're talking about this, I'm remembering, I was flashing back to the day I got married and it was uh, on the McKenna Surf Beach in Maui, Hawaii. And I remember, you know, not just the beautiful sunset, not the the warm sand and just the environment and just all the wonderful things about being there in that moment. What I remember the most is, other than my wife, of course, <laughs> what I remember the most is what the, the, the pastor said is, make sure you don't lose your individuality That's it. in the marriage. And as you're talking about that, I'm remembering, I try and remind myself of that because how easy is it to yeah. become enmeshed? And as therapists, we know what enmeshment is, right? Yeah. We use that term when it comes to boundaries and right. values, and it becomes this blurring, right? This blurring of boundaries and values. And right. how easy is it to kind of adopt the habits and traits and preferences of your partner? Like you were saying, how we defer to our partner mm -hmm. oftentimes. And I think just circling back to that nugget of truth you just dropped on us was that we have to make a decision of when we defer and when we stand our ground or speak. Exactly. Up. And man, is that hard? I'm a passive guy. Like yeah. <laughs> I can defer all day long. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty good at that. I have a hard time speaking up, but I imagine people, some people have the opposite problem. Like you said, people who are more uh, strong willed. And people like you are generally attracted to people like that. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> it's attract. I say that for a reason, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, we have to become adept in both arenas. Mm -hmm. Good at letting go, good at letting be. Um, relationships require some sacrifice. We don't get to have everything we want all the time. Mm -hmm. But if we sacrifice too much, we're in trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we don't give enough, we're in trouble. And I, I think Charlie's absolutely right with how people underestimate how much time and attention and communication it requires to check in with ourselves to see, is, it, is this really okay? You mean it's work? Our partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And put the corrections in and negotiate for our needs. A lot of us grew up in families where we didn't see those kinds of negotiations. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of people submitting, do you know, or dominating, you know, playing mm -hmm. that domination mm -hmm. and submission game. We, we saw a lot, uh, a lot of people in their families saw just um, settling for so much less than is really available, do you know? And so one of the challenges that we have when we work with people is letting their imagination be big. Just I like that. vision big mm -hmm. to, to deem themselves worthy of having a great relationship. And it's in the literature for decades now about re relationships require a lot of hard work. And people said, yeah, yeah, I got a good work ethic. I, I want to do some hard work. But they're not clear about what those pieces of work are. Charlie already mentioned cultivating the qualities that give rise to a great relationship. Mm -hmm. Patience and persistence, assertiveness, black belt listeners, do you know, caring, compassion, empathy, all of these, courage to bring up the tough subjects. These are all foundational. And then the skills of negotiating for our needs and how to speak the truth of our experience without the blame and judgment that's coming out of our minds full of criticism, do you know, and opinions. If we talk about our experience, we're speaking about tender feelings our fears, our insecurities, our loneliness, feelings of longing, disconnection, sadness. Mm. Do you that know? sounds very vulnerable. 
very vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you might say that <laughs> people haven't seen that in their family of origin. Do you know? But all of these are skills and qualities that we can cultivate as long as we have a growth orientation, a personal growth orientation that we can become so much more. And it's a great deal to make with your partner. We're going to bring out the best in each other. Mm. Use all the things that the relationship tosses up. All that crappy stuff is compost to bloom out of. Mm. Let's learn together. Yes, I love that. On the inside of my my wedding ring, can't really see it on camera. I can barely see it with the naked eye. But um, it's engraved Proverbs 27, 17, which is iron sharpens iron. Now, I put that there because I'm a Christian. So it means, you know, the Bible, you know, the scripture means something to me. But the, basically the premise is that we build each other up. Any uh -huh. healthy rela relationships are about building each other up. Like exactly. Said, and it's a constant reminder to me. And I want to bite my tongue and if I'm being of service to my partner and vice versa. And, um, yeah, like you said, to be, it requires being vulnerable, but I love what you say about negotiating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Oftentimes we think, like you said, about having to make a point, defer or be assertive, not, or more aggressive, I say, is a propensity for a lot of people to be more passive or aggressive with their communication. But assertiveness is a skill. Right. I love how you how you frame it, a black belt in communication. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so many of us who believe that we love each other. We shouldn't need to negotiate. I mean, that's something that you do when you're in business. Mm -hmm. This isn't a business relationship. This this is a, a love relationship. It's based on love. It's not based on, you know, tit for tat. It's not based on, you know, in anything. Uh, about what 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 can I give and what what am I going to get out of this? Well, that's that's exactly what's involved with it. <laughs> we mm -hmm. all have self interest, mm -hmm. and we all have interest in preserving the quality of our relationship. And those are the two things that, like you know, we're we're saying earlier, at times are going to come in conflict with each other, and we are going to have to negotiate. We're going to have to know what it is that we're willing to let go of and what it is that we're hoping to gain in the process of accommodating the other person or in the process of holding my ground, taking a stand and saying, this is this is a, it really important to me. And uh, I understand what, what, you, what you need, but you have to recognize that this is something that means a lot to me too. Mm -hmm. That's a hard thing to do. Or something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it can be so really. It sounds like what you're saying, Charlie, is it's not about keeping score, obviously, but more about prioritizing our highest needs and then asking that, asking our partners to help accommodate that. Exactly, exactly. And and to get to the point where you don't need to keep score, mm -hmm. there's got to be a fundamental trust mm -hmm. in the other person's intention and in their motivation to trust that they're not doing or saying this to to hurt me or to control me or and i can count on them to fulfill their word on this so often when there is a breakdown in communications it's it's caused by an underlying breakdown in fundamental trust which wow, is just give me goosebumps Charlie. <laughs> that one makes a whole lot of sense when we talk about trust in a relationship it's, it's not so just trusting your partner so to be faithful right it's trusting exactly. their motivations are in the right place even if they didn't think about all the moving parts yeah right, that may have affected other people that's right and one of that's the right. most efficient ways of building trust is to make agreements and really no kidding keep them hmm. We're always uh, getting couples in trouble and I ask them, <laughs> what are your guidelines and your ground rules and your agreements? And sometimes they haven't, haven't hardly gotten any together. And I give them to them as a homework assignment mm -hmm. to come up with their 10 commandments. <laughs> and, you know, people have to sit down and think about what's important to them. And I always tell them, don't you put anything on that agreement list that you're not really committed to mm -hmm. getting. This is an integrity issue. 
you really want to build the trust, you only agree to what you can put your full heart into. And back mm -hmm. in the day, in the early days that we were together, we, we had to have agreements about don't touch each other when we're angry. Mm. Because, you know, I would right. uh, sometimes <laughs> poke and no throwing things. And then we yeah. had to put no name calling and, and no swearing. You know, some people can tolerate that. Other people can't. Cursing was not in my acceptability list. And then we we put more ground rules on there that we really needed because we were both so intense and passionate, we would get overheated and we had to put a timeout ground rule on there. Mm. If we got overheated that we could take a break, like but it. we could always come back. And that mm -hmm. was ground rule list too. And so we encourage people to work out their agreements and then really no kidding, keep them because the trust will get stronger. And we see a lot of people who are in trouble that have damaged their trust. And we want them to hold on to the possibility that not only can the prior trust level be achieved, but even more than that. We call that stronger at the broken places wow. because of the intent attention that had to be focused on that area of discord. It can, that weak area can become their greatest strength. Wow. I love that, Linda. And I love how you phrase the Ten Commandments as the, the no kidding commitments. So no takesy backsies, right? Yes. <laughs> and like a bone, like you said, uh, the broken place, like if, you know, bones only grow back stronger, if you put a cast on them, right? If you leave them broken, they don't, I mean, they don't exactly get stronger. <laughs> one, one of the things that <clears throat> if we probe with people who have not um, kept uh, or made agreements, which is pretty common. They they don't seem to, often they don't seem to see a need for it. It's like, well, we don't need to learn how to negotiate. We don't need to, you know, we love each other. So why should we need to do that? But so what we, romantic. So naive. <laughs> right. So one of the things that we discover is that um, they have such a dismal record in terms of keeping their agreements that the trust has been damaged to the point where they don't even bother because they don't even expect the other person mm -hmm. to fulfill it. Um, you know, we're so skilled at coming up with justifications, rationalizations, excuses, um, so that when we don't keep an agreement, uh, we, we've got this built-in rational rationale to justify why we did it or why, why we didn't fulfill it. And uh, I think it's so easy to underestimate the damage that that does mm. when we don't own our responsibility for failing to keep our word. It's a huge thing. Linda used the word integrity. Mm. You know, in integrity, trust. I mean, these are the foundational aspects of a relationship. And even if you've damaged your integrity, and even if the trust level in the relationship is low because you've neglected to do what you need to do to sustain it, it's always possible to bring it back. And like Linda said, not only to bring it back to the level that it was before it started to break down, but bring it to a higher level than it was, maybe even higher than you thought it could be. Mm -hmm. It's always possible, but it's going to take some work. That is some real stuff, you know, in terms of managing expectations right you see that a lot with uh, addicts right when you're working with addiction and right. one of the biggest struggles is people lose confidence in your ability to keep your promises people lose yeah. confidence and oh this time i'm going to be clean right mm -hmm. same thing applies in relationships and trust right when trust is broken the expectations of our counterpart become diminished and um, you and lose trust in yourself yes. when you do that. So not only do they not trust your word, but you don't even trust yourself. Like if you hear yourself thinking, well, I'm going to do that. There's a voice in the back of your mind that says, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. Don't bullshit yourself. You know you're not going to do it. And I think the analogy with the recovery from alcohol or drug addiction or any addiction is a good analogy because there's a lot of failures before people mm -hmm. really clean up from their addiction and stay alcohol or drug free. 
And in the process of recovery from damaged trust, there's a lot of fall down, get up, begin again, mm -hmm. fall down, get up and you begin again. And uh, people people want to feel that there's a steady ascent. Yes. <laughs> it's not so <laughs> clean messy. and neat that way. It's three steps forward and two steps back and four steps forward and four steps back. You know, but as long as you're going in the general right direction and that you keep coming back to your attention, you keep coming back to your agreements, you keep coming back to your commitment. And it takes as long as it takes. And it's it's, it's a difficult journey for a lot of us. Uh, we have a skewed sample, of course, because a lot of the people who are in our network come to us because they're in trouble. But when we're looking into our friendship system, you know, we, we see a lot of arduous work that needs to be done there, not just in our clients and students. And so I think it's the human predicament that romantic partnerships and relationships in general are pretty challenging. And I think that's where we get the biggest bang for our buck in the happiness department. Mm -hmm. so the admission ticket's kind of a steep price on it. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that. That's so true. So <laughs> true. And before we drive past this particular subject, I'm wondering how do you help your clients or students get through these, these, uh, subtleties when it comes to the, the, the Ten Commandments, right? The agreements when you're you're coming across things like uh, trust or maybe how, how do you help them follow through on their commitments? Is there any structure around the commitments, any action plans? It's very helpful when people identify what it's costing them. Mm -hmm. And if they can even peek out of the corner of their eye what the benefit is going to be yeah. if they clean up this particular dysfunctional pattern that they have. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are conflict avoidant. Mm -hmm. Do you know, they think conflict is dangerous. And so they try to, I call it candy coat the cesspool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know that you sh sugarcoat the, the dark stuff under there? Mm -hmm. And if they start to see my partner doesn't really trust me because I don't bring up the tough subjects. And when she brings up the tough subjects or he brings up the tough subjects, I change the subject or I say, I don't want to talk about it. Mm. You know, I have my ways of dodging the issue rather than finding my courage to risk leaning into the challenge to have this discussion. And so when people see, because everybody's motivated by self-interest, when they see that they're not as happy as they can be, they don't have the peace of mind that they could have. They maybe don't sleep as well at night because they feel bad about some things that they avoided or that they acted out. And they see that their life could be so improved. They would have deeper trust, more emotional intimacy, more great sex, and fewer mm -hmm. arguments, and fewer incompletions, waiting, nagging, waiting to be addressed, and how they can travel lighter through life, they can really skip and dance and play more, then people start to find some motivation to get past their inhibitions, their feelings of hopelessness, what's the point of even trying, there's no point in even trying, people have a lot of stories they tell mm -hmm. themselves that hold themselves back, because they're afraid that if they risk, get their hopes up, you know, their hopes could be dashed. And that's probably true. Sometimes they are going to be disappointed. And that's part of the admission ticket. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, as you're talking about this, because this happens a lot, from what I've seen, um, when a couple, when someone in a relationship says, I don't want to talk about that or dismisses their partner, how can how can the partner help them maybe mitigate that kind of behavior or avoidance? I mean, how does that, how do you address that in a relationship? Well, that comes up so frequently as I'm sure that you've experienced. Mm -hmm. you work with. Um, and um, for some people that, that, that sounds to them and they take that as an absolute rejection, mm -hmm. any possibility right now of having a conversation. Um, 
And if this is something that is really important to one of the people because they need to have some understanding that can help them clarify what they feel the need to be more understanding about, um, then th they're in a very untenable position if they just accept that as, okay, we don't get to talk about it. Or if by, you know, you know, same token, if they, if they try to force it, you know, if they try to coerce the other person or shame them into, uh, manipulate them into, no, we have to do this now, use force, that doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that um, very often pe people take one of those two positions, either, okay, I just have to accept this or else I'm going to fight it. Um, so the third, and you know, there's more than one other option, but one of the options that's available is to let the other person, um, to, to uh, first of all, acknowledge that they um, they're reluctant to talk about it. I understand that you don't you don't want to talk about this. I, I, I appreciate that, and you know what? <laughs> There's a big part of me that doesn't want to talk about it either. Uh -huh. But um, the reason that I'm bringing it up is because it's really bothering me, and and I and I've been trying to just let go of my concern about this, and I wish I could, but I can't, and I don't want to continue living this way with this kind of a gap between us. It doesn't feel good to me. I don't think it feels good to you. Um, I feel like we have a right to have something more than this. And I'm willing to, uh, I, I do respect your feelings, but at the same time, this is something that um, really is, is critically important to me. And I believe to our relationship, we don't need to talk about it right now, but I, I need to get some sense from you that you are willing to engage in a conversation about it at some point that I would like us to designate now, because I, I, I can't continue to just try to swallow my feelings. It's, it, it's not okay with me to do that to myself or to us. So, you know, it means getting that vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. really the, the solution to, to most of the impasses that couples get is that V word, you know, to get vulnerable, which means to reveal within yourself something that feels very insecure and sh makes you feel shaky because you're giving this person some of your most vulnerable feelings mm -hmm. when, when you do that. And um, what most of us try to do instead is we try to get them to be vulnerable. You know, <laughs> we want to get you, know, you open up. You do get show your belly first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do it first. Yeah, but we have to be willing to take that initial step, mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't guarantee that the other person will come around, but it makes it more likely. And sometimes we have to, you know, we have to be willing to accept things as they are for now but not give up, come back again, you know, at another time, you know, maybe the next day or maybe in a few days, but, but don't give up. If that's something that you need to sustain your well-being and the well-being of the relationship, don't just take no for an answer. Because if you, if you give up too soon, then you're an accomplice to the uh -huh. avoidance pattern yeah you're reinforcing it so the person who really wants to talk about it needs to take the responsibility mm. of taking a stand about how essential and important this is mm. they also need to self-reflect and see if they're knocking themselves out to create a safe secure environment for the person who's reluctant to speak up to speak into because mm. maybe they haven't been as tender and vulnerable and open as they need to be to create the context for the other person to open that up. That could be a big ask too for somebody who has a particular thorn in the, the, the side of the relationship that they want to address and they feel like why should I have to why should I have to accommodate my partner when 
this is an issue they're avoiding. You know, I could see that that would be a tough pill for some people to swallow. It is tough. Mm -hmm. And the level of responsibility required to have a great relationship is pretty big. Mm -hmm. And so if we're in a disempowered position of waiting for the other person to initiate and the other person to step in, the other person to bring up the subjects, and that kind of passivity can get us in a lot of trouble. Another thing that's helpful when there's an avoidant pattern like that, and the the stopper of I'm not talking about it, I don't Mm -hmm. want to talk about it, would you at least be willing to talk with me about what your reservations and considerations are? Uh Because mm-hmm. some people are afraid of getting shamed, or afraid of being mm-hmm. dominated, afraid of being abandoned. And if you know this about me, you know, you'll think less of me, not respect me. And people have a lot of fears. They've got good reasons why they're avoidant. And if they can at least talk about some of those things, that can be a preliminary conversation that sometimes can slick the way Mm -hmm. a deeper conversation about the real issue. But sometimes it's just, it's, it's too hot a material to go right into it. Right. Side door. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Go by the side door. That's I think about that in in therapy when working with clients, oftentimes there's topics that are too triggering, too sensitive, maybe because it's shame, guilt, or otherwise trauma. Um, But if you can talk about their objections, right. Yeah. Like you said, then you can sometimes get them talking. And, you know, the brain's great at following train of thought once it gets started. That's right. right? That's right. <laughs> so I'm hearing validation is really important, too. Like, that's kind of the, the magic ticket here is validating your partner's position and feelings. And then also following that up with why it's important for you to get some cognitive closure on this subject. And, and it's really important to do it in that sequence. Mm-hmm that when somebody is responding or initiating uh, a communication, um, the first thing that you've got to be willing to do is to accept and acknowledge what they're saying, and and maybe even to make sure they understand that you really get it, to uh, feed back to them what it is that you just heard them say. That can be really helpful because until we feel that our experience has been received by the other person and they accepted it, they took it in. They have no space to hear anything that we have to say to try to prove a point to them, to try to uh, refute what they said, to, to give our side of things until they feel that their communication has been accepted and received and internalized. Then they've got space there to hear what we've got to say. But so many people are so quick to get defensive and to justify and to rationalize and to try to persuade the person to see the error of their thinking or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, that, that there isn't that reciprocal exchange that has to take place in order for each person to be able to receive the other person's communication. I'd like to give example from my own personal experience Please. of a life-changing moment when Charlie validated me in a, in a profound way. And um, I've always had a lot of anxiety all through my childhood, the adulthood. And I had a n- nice, um, dignified and graceful persona to cover it up. But inside, mm-hmm. I had a, a whole lot of fear and anxiety going on. And when we were getting closer to each other at the beginning of the relationship, I confessed to him. And I said, I, I get up every morning, I'm I'm afraid. I'm afraid about the challenges that I've taken on. Am I gonna be able to meet my commitments? And I've hidden it from you and I just really wanna confess. I have a lot of fear and anxiety. And Charlie said, bring it all to me, I'm gonna eat it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and I. <laughs> I felt so seen and so heard and so accepted and loved as is that mm-hmm. I'm a mixed bag and I don't have it all together but and I'm not the, secure the other thing, and it's he can love me. The, the other thing that you were thinking, which was absurd, was that I didn't already know that about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like, okay, you think you're hiding okay. it, but it's I'm living with you, for, you know, 
10 years. No, I came out of the closet oh, five, about my fears well, earlier well, than that. Well, have, you know, you know. It was nice to confess and to be accepted. Because don't we all want to be loved as is with our mixed bag self? Oh, absolutely. We've got our signature strengths. We've got our signature strengths and we've got our weak suits, you know? And, you know, maybe some of these areas of weakness, we can grow, we can heal, we can change, we can strengthen them. And some of them are going to be there our whole life. I think in relationships too, there's probably some propensity to hide your weaknesses and hopes that you'll get better in those areas over time in the relationship and then you can start to show all your cards right <laughs> as opposed to just it'll get better and i won't be so nervous and so scared to reveal it right. mm -hmm. good luck with that one uh, <laughs> right. if you're waiting to not be scared about being vulnerable uh dream on mm -hmm. you no know, it's mm -hmm. like be vulnerable and tell the truth anyway mm -hmm. and i mean I, I don't mean to be glib but, you know, really, you're not going to get to that point where you're not afraid to be vulnerable until you've been vulnerable, vulnerable enough to realize that vulnerability isn't so bad. Uh -huh. It's not as dangerous as you think it is. And like Linda said, there will be times when people don't respond the way you'd like them to. And, you know, it'll be uh, unpleasant. It might hurt feelings might get hurt. Uh, you might be disappointed. You might get triggered in some way, um, but you'll get over it. Yeah. And every time we risk it, we grow a little bit more courage. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I love it. That's right. You build that muscle. Yeah. Of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. now, ideally that this happened on both, both sides, right? So there's not this power differential that mm -hmm. creates, you know? Um, but yeah, that's well said. If you just show all your cards, it gets easier. It does. Yeah. Plus you have less mental RAM being tied up, you know, yeah. I think of like a queue, like the more things you have up in the queue, you know, uh, unresolved issues, concerns, problems that you contain, then it clouds the, you know, clouds up the room and energy you have to dedicate to, to things as they come up. That's right. It, it's leaking energy out. Yeah. All those incompletions. Mm -hmm. We're not operating full capacity. And this is one of the things that we find when we're working with couples in counseling or in our workshops, that we appeal to them about, don't, don't you want to be full bore in, in your life, in your relationship, in your life in general? So you're going to need to take some of these incompletions off of the pile that you've been avoiding and actually deal with them. And uh, when people start to take some of those scary issues that they've been dancing around and really find that they can have some success with understanding each other, maybe not agreeing, but understanding is a lot. Mm -hmm. And the energy lightens up. It's not completely resolved, but it's lighter. That eggs them on to take on other issues that have been a bit daunting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's really important not to let those incompletions clog up the channel between us. People get resentful, you know, they get grumpy. They, so you want to clear that stuff out as much as possible, as soon as possible. And it takes a lot of good communication to do it. And people avoid those issues because they are afraid that it's going to make things worse and they're not going to be able, sometimes it does get worse. We get a lot of intense feelings, but to stay with it till you keep moving through it till some understanding takes place. And this is what we offer in the book, a whole lot of ways to repair. I like that. So, to I take like responsibility that. for the part that you played in the breakdown, to make a thorough really thorough apology, a sincere apology to ask for forgiveness. And they may not be ready the first time we ask mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. timing is important and to be willing to do a do over mm -hmm. and to particularly say, and this is what I've learned from it. And you can count on me that I've really learned. And I'm going to show you, I'm not going to keep hurting you and letting you down right. in the way I did before. A living amends to our partners. That's mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, we've talked a lot about effective communication. You've shared a lot in this department. I'm wondering, and I think you address this in your book, are there any particular words, phrases, 
subjects that should be entirely avoided, like that are damaging to a relationship? It's really very dependent upon the unique concerns and uh, experiences of the the couple of, of mm -hmm. the, the people who were involved. <laughs> I mean, for some some people, um, you know, certain words trigger very in, intense emotions. You know, like the word wrong, mm. or sometimes the word you. Mm -hmm. Starting uh, a, a response to a person with the word you almost inevitably mm -hmm. is going to be experienced as an accusation mm -hmm. before you've said the second word after you say you, the other person has already got his defenses. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so ready for know, battle. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my my response um to your question is uh Pay attention to how your partner responds when you use certain words and, and just notice it um, and keep that in mind and um, try to use more of the words that they they seem to resonate to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, if, if they're clearly sensitive to certain words for whatever reasons, then, you know, you might want to find another one. Words do matter. Mm -hmm. Words can hurt. Mm -hmm. um, we do have associations with certain words, particularly if we've been in disrespectful or abusive <clears throat> relationships where we have words have been used as weapons. We weaponized our language. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's very subjective in terms of what a person has experienced in their in their past. But but pay attention to how they do respond uh, to certain terms. There's two words that are you usually triggering for people and always and mm. never because it's unlikely that it's always and never people reach for the most dramatic language they can to mm -hmm. make their point mm -hmm. and so we warn people about wrong you <laughs> always and never but in terms of topics we invite people to hold the vision that there's no taboo topics mm. There's nothing that can't be dealt with with compassion and sensitivity, do you know, and kindness. And if you feel that there's some things that you can't talk about right now, to hold the vision that it will be possible, you may have to do some trust building and make safety and security to put the foundation in that would be able to handle the, the money issues or the in-law issue or the child rearing differences or the sex stuff mm -hmm. do you know that you may have some steps along the way to accomplish first before i had a couple years ago used to call it the no fly zone they had a <laughs> lot of no fly zones that there were a lot of things that they couldn't talk about this, I like that. Thing. and they came to therapy because they didn't want to have no fly zones anymore and they knew that they weren't up to doing it without some tutoring mm -hmm. so you know, we, we worked at what are you so afraid of about talking about this issue? And they they got their strength up so that they finally did feel that there wasn't anything that they couldn't talk about with enough respect and patience and compassion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. very helpful. And uh, I'm sure we're just scratching the surface on <laughs> all that you... <laughs> have to offer in your book and as well as I'm sure your courses and and everything you have there. I'm wondering where can our listeners learn more about you and the work you're doing? Well, best place to look would be in our website. Um, we got tons of stuff on there, um, videos that we've done and, and um, blogs that we've written. And um, the website is um, Bloomwork. All right. This is it right here? There it yeah. is. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. L O O M W O R K dot com. And that'll take you there and um lots of information that uh I think will be helpful. Our our uh seminar schedules on there and um our books and uh wonderful different things that we've offered. Excellent. Wow, it's pretty elaborate. Yeah, those three free ebooks. E yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's These probably are your other books, I, I assume. 
What's that? Are these your other books? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. And this one is our wedding picture. Oh. <laughs> That which doesn't kill us. That was a very dark time in our relationship where we almost threw in the towel. Wow. We were wow. arguing so bitterly and had an irreconcilable difference. And man, we really learned a lot during that challenging time. And that was the book that gave rise to an end to arguing because we, we mm. learned how to have our differences and <laughs> make a big space for it to float until it, it finally did get resolved. But it was a it was a pretty challenging time, and I didn't think we we're going to make it through with an intact family during that time. Mm. So that's a gory story, but it's got a happy ending. <laughs> How wonderful that you have these available and uh, to speak from your lived experience and triumphs and tribulations. And I know what I'm adding to my reading list. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> that's great. Wonderful. And so you have a YouTube channel. Yeah, we got a lot, a lot of stuff on our YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. we have over 600 blogs on psychology today, where oh, we wow. got 10 million hits. Wow, <laughs> so fantastic. So you're deep in this work, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm always uh, happy to find new treasure troves of resources for our listeners and viewers and um, anyone that stumbles along you know, the mental health toolbox. And so I'll be sure to link up everything uh, for you guys there. And then this is your book on Amazon, right? Yep. That's it. Wonderful. And end to arguing, right? 101 valuable lessons for all relationships, which we could all use. <laughs> so definitely excited to uh, learn more there. Um, if our listeners have any more questions or, you know, like to have you back on. I hope you're willing down the road. If you don't mind me checking back in with you, see how things are coming along. I'd Absolutely. love that. Yeah, it's been fun. Excellent. Sure. All right, guys, you have the green light. So ask away and I'll see if I can rope them back in. <laughs> for Linda and Charlie. <laughs> Thanks Answer. for the work you do in the world. Yes, yeah. thank you. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on and uh, love the work you're doing. And thank you for the resources and sharing your wisdom and collective knowledge in this such important area of life. I don't think anything gets more important than relationships. People will be on their deathbed and they're not going to say, I wish I worked more. That's they're right. Say, Man, I wish I had a do over on my relationships. That's exactly right. Right. So thank you for this and the work that you are doing to make sure that we're all living our best lives and fostering healthy relationships. Mm. So, thank you. Right on. Thank you. All right. Till next time. You guys okay. take care. Okay. <laughs> all right.